Okay, everyone, technical difficulties, but this is to intro, this is intro to web security, the SQL, or SQL injection. So what is a SQL injection? SQL is the structured query language, or a language that's used to access or man manipulate databases. So SQL injections are user-inputted SQL queries that are intended to alter the uh, effect of the predefined SQL commands. And SQL injections are one of the top web vulnerabilities. So if you remember the target breach a while back, that is suspected to have involved SQL injections from target's vendor portal access. And after they were able to uh, get into the system, they set up their own database and got the credit card information from there. Uh, the 2008 Harlet, Heartland payment systems breach also involved SQL injections and hackers were able to get information from over 100 million debit and credit cards. A uh, hacker group claims that they were able to get 100K from SQL injections and using that information on other bank accounts and uh, passwords for other sites. So these incidents aren't isolated. SQL injections are estimated to happen about 71 times every hour on website app, websites and applications. So kind of squishing gears into SQL, before you can understand SQL injections, you need to understand what SQL is. The four commands that you need to pay attention to right now are up there, insert lets you add new records to the database. Select is basically the control F of the database world. You can find the records that match. Update lets you change the existing records and drop lets you delete existing records. So when you're logging into an application like that, you're constructing a SQL query where you put in your email and password if the um, inputted information matches what's in the database, then it lets you log in. If it doesn't, then you don't get to log in and you get an error. So in this example, the first user is a regular user. They use the email field the way it's intended to be used. They just put their email. But users suck, so sometimes they don't do what you want them to do. And user number two, Besides that, just putting their email in is too boring. So they put in their email or one equals one. So what happens with this query is it goes into the database and looks for all records where um, the email is equal to bob at example.com or where one equals one. And because one is equal to one, you're going to get all the records. So this lets uh, the second user log in as a random user, and you don't want that because now they have control of your account. And the third user, they're not trying to get information. They just want to wreck stuff. So they go and put x drop table table, and now the entire table is deleted. And no one can log in anymore. Everything's broken. So Thumbs up if you think this snippet of code is secure. Thumbs down if you think it's insecure. And stare at me if I don't make sense. OK, so what's happening here is you are um, constructing a SQL query where you're trying to find the account balance from the user data table where your user is equal to uh, this request dot get parameter customer name. And what that does is it pretty much copies what the user inputted and concatenates that at the end of the query. And then it goes and runs that entire query. So it will run whatever the user put in the field, which is not something that you want because users suck. So how do we stop this? Well, your first option is prepared statements. And this forces the developer to first uh, define all the SQL code and then pass in each parameter um, in the query afterwards. So this lets the database distinguish between what's SQL code and what's um, user inputted data. 
And this way, the attacker isn't able to change the intent of the query. So unlike the previous slide, um, this code will take the request.get parameter, and then instead of just copy and pasting that to the end of the query, and then running all of that as SQL code, it will take the input, turn that into a string, and now instead of looking for the records where, say, it's username is equal to Bob or records where one equals one, it will literally look for username equals Bob or one equals one. And pretty sure no one has that username, so that query is going to fail. Your second option is store procedures, which is really similar to the first option. Um, the main difference is that this code is stored within the SQL database itself and then called from the application instead of being part of the application. So sometimes when you need the user input, you need them to put things like table names and column names. And when you need that, that has to be part of the SQL code. So you can't um, use the previous two options. So what you want to do is whitelist certain options that are valid. So that means unless what the user input matches one of the valid options, it will not execute. It will error out in the default. And then you also want to escape user supplied <laughs> input which is usually a last resort because it doesn't stop everything. Um, so it takes care of special symbols like the tick mark that forces the end of a string. Um, you don't want to escape on your own because it's really easy to make a mistake. So you're going to use the existing security library functions Every database system has its own method for escaping. So in that example, um, the MySQL database uses MySQL real escape string. And you also want to use the principle of least privilege because um, the less permissions you give, the narrower the vector of attack is. So if you only let your user select then they're not going to be able to drop or update, which is what you want. You also want to avoid detailed error messages because that gives the attacker more information. And the more information they have, the more likely it is that they'll be able to figure out how to breach your system. So if you're super vague, like error, they have no idea what the error was. And they won't be able to figure out a workaround. All right. So it's your turn. Who knows what the input value will do with this query? Any guesses? Yes. So what happens is instead of subtracting 100 from the user's balance, this attacker is able to change their balance to $1 million. So great for the attacker, not so great for you. And what do you think you should do so the attacker can't update their balance? any of the previous options. Nick. Uh, to compare the thing with the question mark? Yeah. Was that compared statements? Compared statements, yeah. yeah. Any other options? Don't share the variables with the user with the variables being passed on. Yeah. Yeah. So you can also use um, the principle of least privilege. If the user isn't able to update, then they can't change. But um, 
in this particular case, you need the user to be able to update, so you can't use that. Um, another option is yes, since that's pretty much the equivalent of prepared statements. So, additional resources. You can learn a lot more about SQL at the Introduction to Databases course, Introduction to Databases course here, or you can also try some online tutorials um, if you already understand how SQL works and you want to try SQL injections on your own. Then there's a list of legal sites for you to try to hack, but only do this on the secure Security Lab. Uh, network, you don't want to do this on Secure Mustang Wireless. Questions? Nope. No questions? Anything? Yes. So, what? Like, you said these are, these happen like 71 times an hour. Why, why are there just no databases anymore? Like, what's stopping people? What's stopping people from just dropping all the databases? Well, like, using the preventative methods mentioned in the slides. Yeah. Back to slide. Is that something one figure attempts to? Uh, you see why, or is that actual successful see why? Attempt, not successful. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Have you tried any attacks like that yourself? Um, so when I took the intro to databases class, the professor set up a specific website for us to hack, and it was pretty cool. Okay, so we're going to go upstairs and do an activity in the lab.